Turn please in your Bibles with me today to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. And we'll be going next to 1 John chapter 1. You might have that at the ready. While you're turning to Mark chapter 12, I want to read what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. He says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Be ye reconciled to God. I have a message today about repentance, reconciliation, and forgiveness. We read in Mark chapter 12. Verse 28, and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, this is after Jesus put down the error of the Sadducees and their unbelief in resurrection. So one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Jesus, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Not too long ago I preached a message on the greatest commandment uh, with a simplistic seven-point outline and message that if you love the Lord Jesus, then you will do certain things. First of all, you will love his word. Secondly, if you love the Lord Jesus, then you will seek his fellowship. Three, if you love the Lord Jesus, then you will desire to obey him. Fourthly, if you, if you love the Lord Jesus, then you will enjoy praising him. If you love the Lord Jesus, you'll not enjoy the fellowship of his enemies. Six, if you love the Lord Jesus, then you will willingly suffer for him. And seven, if you love the Lord Jesus, then you will long for his soon return. That was my simple seven-point outline in that message. The final point in that message was that if you do not love the Lord Jesus, it can only be because you do not know him, meaning that you are in all likelihood not saved, because to know him is to love him. There are, of course, many points we could add to that seven-point list. We do know that the Lord expects our obedience Jesus said in John 14, verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved in my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The Lord Jesus expects our obedience, but the kind of obedience he is looking for is not just outward, external obedience. He's looking for obedience from the heart from a sincere heart, desire to bring him joy. And if you love the Lord Jesus, if you love the Lord with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, then your heart's desire will be to bring him joy. So one of the things that we could add to that seven-point list is that if you love the Lord Jesus, you will not allow sin to part your fellowship with him. You'll not remain in a state of sin that separates you from him. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. Jade covered this section of scripture a few weeks back in his study through 1 John. I'm just going to read here beginning in verse 5, where John writes, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. He says in verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John says here, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A very necessary aspect of maintaining fellowship and a right relationship with the Lord and loving Him with all of your heart is daily repentance and confession of sin. That, of course, doesn't mean just generally praying a catch-all prayer like, Lord, please forgive all my sins. John says here, if we confess our sins, and we need to acknowledge all of our sin and ask Him to cleanse us of it by the power of His blood. 
And then John says, verse 9, if we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once we're saved, we do not confess our sins and seek forgiveness to maintain salvation or because we fear the loss of our salvation. We continually confess and seek forgiveness to maintain fellowship with the Lord and to avoid chastening. We don't want anything hindering. I don't want anything hindering my relationship with the Lord. Turn over to Psalm 32. This is a familiar passage of scripture to most of us. David writes here in Psalm 32, verse 1, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. David says, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Failure to acknowledge our sin before God can lead to his hand of chastening being heavy upon us, as David says here. And by the way, that can also result from failure to right the wrongs that we've committed against others. God may dry up our source of provision. He may turn us over to calamity or allow trouble to come our way that we may have been otherwise protected from. God's heavy hand of chastening, David talks about here, may at times be no more than an extreme sense and awareness of the conviction of the Holy Spirit whom we have grieved. And that sense can be extreme. But that alone can be powerful enough to drive us to our knees in repentance. David says here in verse 3, When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah, which we know means stop and consider these things. And he says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. So pause and think about that for a minute. Then David says, verse 6, For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. David says here, when I came to my senses and I confessed my sin, God was standing there with open arms waiting for me to come to him, ready and willing to pardon. Just like in the Jesus parable of the prodigal son. God wants us to acknowledge our sin before him, to confess all sin and to seek forgiveness. But he wants to hear it from our lips, that we know we did wrong, that we are sorrowful over our sin. In the same way that the Lord Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, that the Father knows what we have need of even before we ask, but he still wants us to ask. And he also says, you have not because you ask not. In that same way, he stands ready to abundantly pardon and forgive, but he wants to hear from our own lips our confession of our sin. His command is that we acknowledge our sin before him and that we confess it and that we seek forgiveness. And so then David says in verse 6, For this, to confess our transgressions to the Lord, shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou may be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. For this, this is why we come to the Lord in prayer, to confess our transgressions to the Lord. Everyone that is godly will pray to God to do that in a time when he may be found. However, and more to the point of this message, Many times, our duty does not end with confession and contrition before the Lord. Because quite often, our sin is against our fellow man. Against uh, someone that we know that we have sinned against and with whom we need to reconcile. Whoever it is, whether it's parents, brother, friend, or foe. But who, for purposes of, the, of this message, I'll refer to as our brother. Just as the Lord wants uh, to hear it from our lips that we acknowledge our sin before him. In that same way, he expects us and in fact commands us to right the wrongs that we have committed against our brother as well. And he says that we cannot be reconciled to him until we do so. This begins by acknowledging our sins against them and seeking their forgiveness as well, expressed from our lips in their hearing and not left unsaid. 
that comes easy for some people. But for some, it's very difficult and seemingly unthinkable. Refusal to acknowledge our sin against a brother or a marriage partner or children or parents is most often rooted in pride and stubbornness and is one of the worst kind of sins that there is. We just read in Mark chapter 12 where Jesus said in verse 29, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. But then he said in verse 31, And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. We talk a lot about our love for God and what we want to do for Him. The pop Christian churches today are very focused on vertical praise to God and the expression of our love to the Lord. And we probably don't hear enough talk about our duty to love others and how we are to express that. I preach a lot about our duty to the Lord Jesus and to His church and to His Lordship and perhaps not enough about personal relationships and our duty to love each other. Jesus said of all commandments, the second most important is that I am to love my neighbor as myself. And the Bible says that is especially true for those in the church. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, he says, As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, Paul says, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Turn back to Leviticus chapter 19. I have a slightly shorter five-point list of things today that we should all be doing if we are loving our neighbor as ourselves. And first of all, I'm going to say that if you love your neighbor as yourself, you will not want to see them harmed in any way. I think that's rather obvious. You're not going to want to see your neighbor harmed in any way. Secondly, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you'll not want to see them going hungry or destitute. I think those things are, those two things are rather obvious. The third item on my list is less obvious, but just as true. That is that if you love your neighbor as yourself, you will not let them continue in a sin that is hurting them. In fact, this is so important that the Lord included it in a command in the law of Moses here in Leviticus chapter 19, just to make it plain. Leviticus 19, verse 17, we read, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. The way this two-part Verse is worded here. It says that allowing a brother to continue in sin is actually evidence that you hate him in your heart. That's why those two concepts are put together in this verse. But if we love our brother as ourself, if we know he's caught up in a sin, meaning, of course, in the course of action that the Bible calls sin, not some made-up sin that Pharisees want to pin on somebody, But if we know he's caught up in a sin that we know the Bible calls sin, we will confront him with the goal of restoring him. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault or a sin, ye which are spiritual, who aren't caught up in that sin, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, because you too can be caught up in that same sin. There before the grace of God go I. Then he says, verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So if you love your neighbor as yourself, first of all, you'll not let them continue in a sin that is hurting them. You'll confront them with the goal of restoration. Fourthly then, point number four, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you will not do anything to tarnish their reputation. Here in Leviticus 19, we also see God's law supporting this point. And the preceding verse here, Leviticus 19 and verse 16, we read, Thou shalt not go up and down as a tail-bearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. God says, this is my law. You'll not go up and down as a tail-bearer among my people. Here again, there are two parts to this verse, and once again, that's because the two are interrelated. Because to spread a false report about someone is an attack on his livelihood and on his very life. Not only in the way of character assassination, but also in murderously bringing false accusations to have him put to death, which was in view here as well. The Bible, we know, has much to say on this topic of slander and tail-bearing 
etc. We read in Exodus 23, verse 1, Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Over in Psalm chapter 15, there's an important passage here. Psalm 15, we read in verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell on thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Then we read in verse 3, He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Important concept here. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you not do anything to tarnish your reputation. In charging Titus with his duty in pastoring and establishing the church at Crete that Paul left him there at, Paul told Titus in chapter 3 of that epistle, in verse 1 to 2, to quote, Put them in mind, among other things, to verse 2, Speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Paul told Titus it was his responsibility to make sure that the church understands their duty. He was to put them in mind among all these other things, that they are also to speak evil of no man. That word evil, in this context, has to do with malicious intent, an unjustified intention to bring harm to someone else, to harm their reputation through your words, to cause them harm. And so speaking evil in this context means speaking against one's character with an evil or malicious intent to defame the person and bring him into disrepute. Proverbs 22, verse 1, says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. The principle here is very important. As part of loving our neighbors as ourselves, we have been charged with protecting each other's good reputations. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, you'll not do anything to slander him, to defame him, or to tarnish his reputation. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. Point number 5 on my 5 point outline here on loving your neighbor as yourself. Point number 5 is if you love your neighbor as yourself, you will not want to let anything that you may have done to hurt them go unresolved. I'll say, say that again. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you will not want to let anything that you may have done to hurt them go unresolved. You'll not want to let anything that they may hold against you go unreconciled. You'll not want to give any reason for God to avenge them of your sin because you refuse to correct it. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 17, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. When we've been wronged, we're not to return evil for evil. God says he will exact vengeance on those who have wronged us. And he always does that in due time. Meaning in his perfect time, by the way, not ours. Conversely, though, if we have wronged others, and the Bible says in many places that it is our duty to reconcile with any brother that we may have offended. And if we do not do so, the Lord may very well take vengeance against us on their behalf. Here in Matthew chapter 5. Lord Jesus says in verse 21, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Verse 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Of course, as we've talked about before, the central message of the Sermon on the Mount is that we are to be holy, not as the Pharisees. Throughout this discourse, Jesus repeats the phrase, Ye have heard it said, but I say unto you, in other words, the Pharisees are not your spiritual authority, I am. The Pharisees focused on the letter of the law, not the spirit and purpose of the law. Their fatal error, the fatal error of the Pharisees, was their presumption that God's law prohibited only the sinful act and not the sinful thought. That the law can be kept externally 
while your heart can be filled with hatred and that you can obey God with a bad attitude. Jesus corrected this false view of the law by saying that obedience must be from the heart. He said in Matthew 5, 27, You've heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. God prohibits a sinful thought as well as the act. And you cannot obey God with a bad attitude. Obedience has to be from the heart. It must be cheerful. And so Jesus says here in verse 21, You've heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. All the modern perversions, the Bible perversions, corrupt, verse 22 here, as most of us know, uh, where the text says, Whosoever is angry with his brother, quote, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. The NIV and all the other perversions we know delete the phrase without a cause, so Jesus can be accused of sin. But it's not a sin to be angry. It is a sin to be angry and to blow up for no good reason. Rash, uncontrolled anger is sinful. As James says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And Proverbs 14, verse 7 says, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. And so Jesus says here, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. That word Raka in this verse is a transliteration of a very derogatory Aramaic expression that was used to show utter contempt for another person and to describe him as an empty-headed, worthless, mindless person. It was a slanderous insult constituting defamation of character, which is actionable at law now just as it was then. And so Jesus says he'll be in danger of the council of the Sanhedrin. He can be taken to court. Jesus then says here, Whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. This word fool here is used in the sense that is used throughout the Proverbs, not merely of a man lacking wisdom, but instead of a wicked reprobate who deserves to go to hell, to wish damnation upon him. Jesus says to one who would say such things that you are deserving the same hell fire that you cursed him with. So then he says directly to the point in hand in verse 23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. He says, If thou rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, that you have offended him, that he has good cause for accusation against you, that he has a complaint against you that he could take before God. Then Jesus says, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. There's a specific reason that Jesus says, Leave there thy gift before the altar. That's so that you remember to come back and take care of your duty to God after you reconcile with your brother. We are not to let disputes with others stand in the way of our relationship with God. However, God says your relationship with him cannot be right as long as your brother has good cause for accusation against you if you mistreated him and not made it right. And mistreating others is one of the surest ways to cut off and to disrupt our fellowship with the Lord. A man who mistreats his wife will not even have his prayers heard, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. He says, likewise, ye husbands, Dwell with them with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Then he says, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, as a co-equal heir together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So Jesus says here in verse 24, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. What do we need to do to be reconciled to our brother? if we've done something to offend him. Two things we need to do, repentance and restitution. Repentance and restitution. First, go to him and acknowledge your guilt. Just as we need to confess all of our sin before God 
acknowledging all of our sin and asking him to cleanse it, all of it, by the power of his blood. So when we go to our brother, we need to come clean with all of our sin against him and seeking his forgiveness for all of it. Not merely giving a half-hearted catch-all apology or leaving our brother any reason to have odd against us or to remain offended. Go to him and acknowledge your guilt and seek forgiveness. And then secondly, we may often also need to make restitution. We may need to do whatever we have to do to undo the wrong and make it right. We read much in the Mosaic Law about God's civil laws of restitution. For instance, in Exodus 22, verse 1, God says, If a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox, or four sheep for a sheep. In verse 4, he says, If the theft be found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. Verse 5, If a man cause a field or a vineyard to be eaten, and shall put in his beast, and shall feed another man's field, or the best of his own field, and the best of his own vineyard, he shall make full restitution, etc., etc. God says, if you've done wrong, you need to make it right. Which God says includes payment of punitive damages, of either double or up to five times the amount of actual damages. At the very least, we have to have the guts to go to our brother and acknowledge our guilt, all of it so as to leave no reason for him to remain offended. Say you're sorry and ask forgiveness. Way back in the olden days in 1970, uh, when I was a kid, there was a popular punchline from a blockbuster movie, Love Story, that starred Ally McGraw and Ryan O'Neill. The punchline in the movie was, quote, Love means you never have to say you're sorry. Ally McGraw later said she always hated that line and considered it ridiculous. The fact is that loving your neighbor as yourself means you always have to say you're sorry when you've done them wrong. And yet, due to stubborn pride, some people just can't seem to be able to bring themselves to admit error and seek forgiveness. What we need to see today is that there is no greater weakness. There is no greater folly. There is no greater and more destructive character flaw than for a man or a woman or a boy or girl, to be unable to admit that you've done wrong and to seek forgiveness. In James chapter 5, we find a very important two-part verse on this topic. James 5 verse 16, James says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Then in that same verse, James then says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Sometimes we quote that last phrase out of context. But the two parts of this verse are directly related to each other. Because the righteous man in this verse is the man who confesses his faults, meaning his offenses against his brother. And the most sincere, the most fervent, the most pious and well-intentioned prayer of a man who cannot confess his offenses in order to reconcile with his brother avails nothing. Which is precisely why Jesus says here in Matthew 5.23, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, verse 24, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. A man's relationship with the Lord cannot be right as long as his brother has good cause for accusation against him. And mistreating others is one of the surest ways to cut off and to disrupt our fellowship with the Lord. If you've wronged your brother, go to him, tell him you've done wrong, tell him all you've done wrong, tell him how sorry you are, and ask for his forgiveness. But even then, after we've done all that, there's still yet another aspect of this entire equation that may stand in the way of reconciliation. And this has nothing to do with the fault or responsibility of the offending party. And that is when the offended brother is, due to the evil of his own heart, unwilling to forgive. On this subtopic, turn over to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Just as some people, due to stubborn pride, have a very difficult time bringing themselves to seek forgiveness, so do some also have a very difficult time forgiving others. And for some, in the worst of cases, 
Some have a problem in both of these areas. Some people hold grudges and bring up sins of the past that should have been long ago forgiven and forgotten, but they cannot forgive and they cannot forget or let the offender forget. The Bible is clear, however, that none of us has any right to withhold forgiveness when it is properly sought. We have no right to withhold forgiveness when it's properly sought. And when we refuse to forgive, at that point, the offended party becomes the offender. Lord Jesus made that very clear here in Matthew chapter 18. Verse 21, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. He told this parable then. Jesus said, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. When he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Verse 27, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Just on the spot, just forgave the debt. Verse 28 then, But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him just a hundred pence. He laid, on, laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. Verse 30, And he would not but went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredst me. Shouldst thou not have also had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and had delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Verse 35, Jesus says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Notice that Jesus said here, from your hearts. That means truly forgive, not just with lip service. It means both to forgive and to forget. The same way, by the way, God forgives us and casts our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Removes our sins as far about from us as east is from west. There is a popular proverbial phrase attributed to a 17th century British poet that says, quote, To err is human, to forgive divine. I do think there's actually some truth to that phrase because the capacity to forgive really comes far more from the fruit of the Spirit working in our lives than from our old nature. Something in our flesh wants to see those who have wronged us suffer. The old nature wants revenge, and it wants to get even. But to the contrary, the Lord Jesus says here that we who have been forgiven so much have no right to deny forgiveness to an offender when it's properly sought. In Luke 17, Jesus says again, verse 3 of Luke 17, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if you repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in the day, and seven times in the day turn unto thee, saying, I repent, Jesus says, Thou shalt forgive him. None of us has any right to withhold forgiveness when it is properly sought. In closing, I'll just remind us once more of what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. He said, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This verse is not just about the initial conversion that occurs at the point of salvation, being reconciled to God. We can all, as born-again Christians, get out of fellowship with the Lord due to unconfessed and unrepentant sin. And when that happens, we too need to be reconciled to God. And we cannot be reconciled to God when we have wronged our brother and he has ought against us, as Jesus said in Matthew 5. Or, if we are refusing to forgive him for an offense against us. First, we must reconcile with our brother. And then our fellowship with the Lord can be restored. So, turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. 
Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to conclude with just a reading from four verses here in Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul really very neatly summarizes uh, the main thrust of this message. Paul says in Ephesians 4 and verse 29, Let no corrupt communication, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We're not to say anything to tarnish our brother's reputation. We're to protect the reputation. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 31, Paul says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That's a good uh, short summary of this message as a whole. I'll leave it at that for today. So with that, I'm going to ask Brother Sean to close us with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for your word. Lord, it is powerful, it is sharp, and it convicts and it encourages and it heals and it steers us, Lord, to get on correct course when we get off with you. We pray that it would always do so, Father, and that you would give us the humility of heart to be willing to go your way, realizing that it's the best way, Lord. Um, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is death. So, Father, help us to take these lessons uh, literally to heart and to uh, just... Do, do more to follow you, Father. Do more to respond to your word. And just uh, continue to let uh, our pastor and brother Jay, Father, to speak the truth that, that penetrates our hearts. And we just thank you that your word is alive in them. We thank you for the messages we heard today. We pray uh, just for continued work of the Holy Spirit, Father, to, stable, to establish us, Father, to strengthen us and to help us stand upon that rock bless everybody father today and through this week let us keep our eyes on you we ask it in jesus holy name amen amen thank you brother sean